Luke chapter 22. We've been in this last week of the Lord. There's a lot of momentous things take place um, all through his life, but certainly this time. In verses 31 through 34, uh, Jesus tries to warn Peter. Peter is a, I want to say up front, Peter's a great, great man, uh, but he was an impetuous man. And uh, that was a strength and a weakness. Peter's going to say and do something if it's wrong, you know, but he's not going to stand there uh, with a dumb look on his face, you know. He's, he's never going to, he's a decisive character. Uh, as we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we're thankful for the new day, for the church, for Christ who bought it with his precious blood. We're thankful for the opportunities that are afforded to us as North Americans to live in a relative peace. We pray that uh, you might ever allow this to be so with us. We pray that you would be with the country and be with your people within this country. For we recognize that in times past, whenever the righteous remnant is no longer of sufficient strength and number and sufficient determination to, to stand for what is right, that judgment comes. And we pray that, that we would do what we can uh, so that our people would be able to do uh, the work that you've assigned to us without molestation. Continue with us now in this study. We pray in Jesus' name. And amen. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, uh, and uh, may not fail. And you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. But he said to him, Lord, with you I'm ready to go both to prison and to death. And he said, I say to you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you have denied me three times that you may know me. Uh, uh, three times that you know me, sorry. <clears throat> He, uh, as I noted last time we got started on that, uh, Luke doesn't give you specific time a lot of times, uh, but here he gives Peter this warning, and I mentioned, I think last time, he's, you know, Simon, Simon, you, you know how people do that. That's what that is. Uh, he's trying to get his attention. Um, he knows what they're about to face, all of them, and he's trying to, trying to prepare them for the onslaught of temptation uh, that's coming toward them. And uh, he, when he does that, you see, you know, Peter is, uh, you know, I'm not going to do that. I believe, I think he believed that with all his heart when he said that. And I believe what he's, uh, 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 or he demonstrates, not I believe, he demonstrates that he meant it whenever this mob shows up to arrest the Lord and he draws his sword and he's going to do the Alamo. He could handle that. That's what he was prepared for. But the way the events unfolded, he was not prepared for, and Jesus knew that prior to it taking place. And he tried to tried to tell him uh, that he was about to be put in the vice. Uh, you know, the, the devil knows each of our weaknesses. So he's not going to waste time. He didn't get to be you know, the malevolent character that he is, uh, not knowing what he was doing. And so he doesn't waste time uh, on tempting a person with things that are not a temptation to them. He's going to come to the area of weakness, whatever it is, and everybody's got them. And uh, that's what happens here. Uh, what happens here with, with uh, Brother Peter? You notice the, he says that the devil has, has sought and gained permission to, to sift you like wheat. Now, where else in the Bible do you think of that that happened? Exactly. Have you considered my servant Job? And it's, it's a lot more detail filled in with Job. Now, he lost everything. He lost his family. He lost his wealth. He lost his personal health. He lost really the support of his wife and remained faithful to the Lord. And there is no reason to believe that that kind of thing does not continue to go on in relation not only to Peter and Job, but to everybody else. There is, uh, we are involved uh, in a war, a war between good and evil that's been going on since the garden. And the decisive victory has been won. What we're in, believe it or not, is kind of the mop-up operation. Uh, but we don't want to take that, uh, take that lightly. Verse 33, the 
Savior has prayed for all his disciples, Peter and all of them. John 17 tells us more about that, and specifically he prayed for Peter, who has a, a leading role to play still. You know, who was one of the pillars in the church in Jerusalem? This is after the Lord's crucifixion, after the events of this time. Peter. He apparently was just a natural leader that, uh, that people would, uh, would listen to and follow. And you know that from if you just go out to a playground and watch kids play, there's always going to be a leader. Maybe a boy, maybe a girl, maybe the biggest one, maybe the littlest one, but there's going to be one out there in the air. Everybody recognizes it. That well, Peter was that guy. Joe? Cause you to start second guessing, you know, and that's exactly how that play is going to play out. Y'all know the story. Uh, have they? I mean, they were ready. To, uh, uh, there was two of them had swords. You know, obviously, Peter's one of them, and um, and he's ready. To, he's ready, you know, just bring it. Um, and so, I don't. You didn't. I grew up around fishermen. Fish, fishermen are are um, pretty salty fellows. As a, as a rule, they work real hard. And they they in a dangerous business, and uh, they're against the we you know the weather's against them, and and there's stuff in the ocean that will eat you, and 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 a lot of things that they face, and so it's not a surprise that he would be a pretty bold uh, character. Um, to me, it's not, and uh, and yet, as Joe points out, the devil doesn't hit him just like at one time. He's going to drag this thing out, and so Jesus has prayed. He's, he, uh, he knows Peter's inward weakness too well. Uh, you remember when he jumped out of the ship and goes walking to the, to the Lord on the water. And then, then he looks around at the waves and takes note of the wind. You know, uh, I, like I grew up on boats and stuff, and so Lendl's going to look at the waves and take note of the wind before he ever gets on the boat, preferably. Uh, but certainly once you're out there, you, uh, but he's got absolute confidence and, and then all of a sudden, I, I'm, I don't know how it came to him, but probably like, what have I done? And, uh, and stepping out here. And so uh, he, he didn't have, at that time, the strength to remain firm. And so, and he doesn't hear in this circumstance. Uh, in the story of Peter's, Peter's uh, fatal self-confidence, you see a, you, you see a pitiful thing, uh, a... A pitiful fall, really. And that is put in, no doubt, to warn all the rest of us. Not to look down on Peter or to put him down, uh, but to for all of us to take note of the fact, if a man as dedicated and as bold and, and all as Peter was could succumb to the temptation like that, what does that say to the rest of us? You see, don't get to hold a head and talk about what you're not going to do because you don't know what you're going to do under, under circumstances like that. And so a healthy confidence is, is necessary for every Christian, but it's got to be in the sense of reliance on the Lord, that we're going to put our faith in Him, uh, not in our own resources. And, you know, that, that's a big, big difference because uh, without Him, of course, we're not going to be successful. I don't care, uh, you know, how big and tough you think you are, if you know karate, you know, or judo or whatever. I mean, you just without the Lord's blessing, um, then we're at great, great risk. Now comes the episode of the two swords, you, verse 35 through 38. It says, and he said, uh, make sure I'm right with this. Um, and he said to them, when I sent you out with the money belt and bags, you did not lack anything, did you? They said, no, nothing. And he said to them, but now whoever has a money belt is to take it along, likewise also uh, a bag, and whoever has no sword is to sell his coat and buy one. For I tell you that this which is written must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with transgressors, for that uh, which refers to me has its fulfillment. And then 
They said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. And so you, you see a couple of things in that. One, one thing that you see is the Lord is not anti-self-defense. Uh, a sword is an offensive weapon. You know that. It's, it's not, you know, uh, in other words, it's not there to dig slit trenches and stuff like that. It's, it's there for, for the business of martial uh, power, a force of arms. And so he tells them to, to arm themselves. Um, during the time when he uh, sent them out initially, he told them not to do any preparation like that. Well, that was at the peak of his popularity, and everywhere that he went, people uh, people were uh, glad to receive him and glad to take care of him. That's about to change, isn't it? Because the Lord is now about to become an executed felon, an enemy of the state. Um, we just assume certain personal rights and liberties because we've grown up in this country. You know, uh, you got the right to remain silent, you know, and the Mirandizing and all of that takes place. You've seen that on cop shows. We had an old cop here named Alan Landine was retired out of the Houston force. And when they started making Alan Mirandize people, his was a shorter than the one that they tell you. To, uh, his was you have the right to be silent. That was it. And, and uh, of course, he said, you know, I tell him you're going to jail. I, and you can just explain it all to the judge, and, and he's going to decide. No point in you and I having a discussion. And uh, so you got to just be quiet. Um, and uh, today that has to be elaborated a little bit further. Uh, but uh, at this time, uh, when he first sent them out, well, then they were they were they were received with open arms, and that's that's going to change. Uh, and he knows that. In verse 36, he says, the hour has now struck when it's all going to be different. Uh, from now on, uh, they're no longer going to be in the same situation they were, where they were honored and entertained and, and as the beloved of the master. Uh, he's already been rejected by the Jewish authorities, and uh, they're about to trump up some charges by which they can get him killed, killed as a criminal, a hated criminal, uh, even the Romans, uh, you, you didn't execute a Roman by um, hanging them on a cross. That was just considered too bad. Uh, and, and But that's about what they're about to do, of course, to Jesus. And uh, so the immediate result of him being rejected by the Jewish authorities for the disciples is that they're going to start being recognized as followers of this, this fellow that the authorities are going to, they're going to lie about him, but they're going to say he's a subversive. He is a counter-revolutionary. He's against Caesar. And there were a bunch of those people that were um, in the Jewish community at that time. And so they're trying to tar him, or they're going to tar him with that. And uh, so they can't depend any further on generous uh, provision for their needs on the part of the people. And so they're going to have to rely on their own strength and energy and on each other and on the Lord to make their way through a very hostile world. Um, I remember a fellow I went to school with was smuggling Bibles into Soviet Russia uh, back when it was still Soviet Russia. And he said, I had an old dumb kid with me from Arkansas. That's his words, not mine. And uh, so he's wearing cowboy boots, and they stopped and found some Bibles. Oh, boy. And uh, But he, he said, I remember that. He said, you never give up anything. He said, I hope y'all don't become smugglers of anything other than Bibles, but don't give up anything to the authorities. So I said, is this all your Bibles you got? And I went, no, I got some here in my boots and all that. And then Bill said, I'm going, oh, man. You know, this guy's going to get us killed. Uh, they weren't killed. That was during the time of... of um, Mr. Brezhnev, and they were starting to, you know, act more reasonable. I've told you this story a number of times, but he said one of the Russian uh, officers, military officer, that had really acted like he was he was against us. And when everybody left the room, said he grabbed one of those Bibles or some of that literature and put it in his tunic and zipped it up, and went and and walked out. You know, and so things were changing at that time. wasn't like it is today. Well, these fellows are about to, they're changing for them, and it's changing for the worse. 
And uh, he, the state of affairs is going to arise, uh, in verse 37, when that which was predicted in Isaiah 53 is going to be realized. The Messiah is going to be reckoned as a transgressor and killed as such. Was he a transgressor? Had he violated the law? God's law? He wrote God's law, and he hadn't violated it. He hadn't violated Roman law. He was no threat to Caesar. You know, the Romans were pretty paranoid. They were, they were in some ways kind of like Mr. Putin and his bunch, real paranoid all the time. And, and uh, if you said something about insurrection or uh, if you could hang that on somebody, you could get them killed because they just weren't going to fool with you. They got, the, the Romans were law and order people. You have to give them that. And so they didn't put up with any foolishness at all. But it did open the door because they weren't real good, apparently, about investigating things. Um, but this, you know, Jesus is the Lamb of God. And he is there to, to lay his life down, isn't he? I mean, it's not like he couldn't, uh, that he couldn't handle the situation and he couldn't um, stop the whole proceeding and, and keep from being uh, executed. Are mistreated. All he had to do is said Michael, and uh, uh, you know he Michael and the host would have been there, and probably anxious to to come, uh, because they serve our Lord very, lo very loyal to him, um, and so they're gonna they're gonna do what they're gonna do. It, that's kind of the way a lot of people are today, isn't it? And so as things are going with the master. It's going to go with them. And so they have, they have got to be thoroughly equipped and armed at whatever cost with an unbreakable courage and a, a deep determination so that they don't give up the struggle. Uh, they're going to have to gear up, and they're going to have to be exceedingly tough men from a, a spiritual, mental standpoint. Um, you know, they, they've been talking a lot on TV I don't know how much of it you watch, but about the morale in this war in Eastern Europe, the morale of the Ukrainian people as opposed to the Russian people. Well, the morale among the Russians is really low. Uh, they're sent somewhere and uh, lied to, and they got old beat up, wear out equipment, and they're not fed, and they're not being paid in a lot of instances, and they're not mad at anybody in Ukraine. A lot of them, many of them. The Ukrainians, on the other hand, whether you like it, I don't care about the governments. I'm just talking about the people. They, on the other hand, were minding their own business in their own country, and these people invaded them. And so their morale is high in the sense that they are determined to repel the invaders. And so uh, you, Jesus knows that his army is not a carnal army. What kind of army is it? What kind of kingdoms he established? Spiritual kingdom, isn't it? My kingdom is not of this world. If it, my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. So he was here to, to, to lay his life down. He intended to do that. And so uh, he's trying to bolster them up in, in that inner struggle uh, that a man has to deal with when he goes into harm's way. And the disciples, in verse 38, are still blind to the spiritual nature, largely blind, to the nature of his work in his kingdom. They are still hoping that he's going to establish an earthly messianic kingdom by means of physical force. Obviously, that's Peter's understanding when he steps out here in a few minutes and, um, you know, takes that sword out that he already had one, apparently. You know, Jesus said, go buy one if you don't have one. Peter's got one. Uh, and but he, he stopped that immediately, we'll see. And so to be a wholehearted follower of the crucified Lord in a world in which the power of sin and evil brings one inevitably to scorn and hatred on the part of those who reject Christ and his servants is going to be their lot. Um, I don't know if you've noticed this, but the hostility the secular world has towards the Lord's people has been on the increase. Uh, this past uh, Easter, 
Well, we don't. We we celebrate the resurrected Lord every Lord's Day, but the wider religious community picks a day uh, that they think about that. But I think I think it was the New York Post carried an article by a guy who was a rabid atheist, and he said we ought to do do away with. He called God a vengeful God and had a lot of ugly things to say. Now there have always been people that believed that, but. I'm old, uh, young enough to remember, or old enough to remember, that they wouldn't have put it in the paper. Not very many years ago. Not in this country. And they, uh, with all the problems they got, I, you wouldn't put something like that in the paper in, in Guatemala. Uh, but once. Uh, and uh, you never would get out of jail, if you got to the jail. And so... You, you have that hostility. I'm not advocating that. I'm just saying that's where that is. And so that hostility is on the increase. And we may need some of this kind of admonition that the Lord's given to his disciples here. Uh, the only way to remain firm in a world like that is to be spiritually equipped with his power and be armed with the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. Uh, that's the only way to do that, and there will never be another way. The use of material force in the vindication and the extension of his church on earth has been, has been in times past advocated by some sections of, of they call themselves Christians, but that is absolutely foreign to the teaching of Jesus, isn't it? Uh, I told you, I think last time I've been in, in Britain, and walked around among the ruins uh, of a lot of these uh, old churches. Some of them were Protestant. Some of them were Catholic. And, and when they were assaulted and burnt and destroyed, uh, the people that did that thought they were doing that in God's service and he was on their side. And he never advocated anything like that. Absolutely foreign to anything that the, that the Lord ever taught. Uh, there's a right and there's a wrong. And, and uh, it's, uh, as you know, I have no problem with vigorous debate about things of spiritual nature. But coercive uh, physical force used in trying to advance the kingdom, that's, that's totally foreign. Now, he's given them the warning, Jesus has, that they, they better get ready for what's coming. It's all he can do. He's just, but he's concerned about him. Just think about the stress that he's under, and he's still thinking about them. And we're going to see him think about them some more. Verse 39 through verse 46 is Gethsemane. And he came out and proceeded, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples also followed him. And when he had arrived at the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and he began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Now the angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. And being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples, and he found them sleeping from sorrow. And said to them, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not enter into temptation. So we enter the inner sanctuary, if you will, of gospel history. And we see this incredible commencement of our Lord's, the religious world calls it the passion. The suffering that he is subjected to that ends only after he's endured being totally forsaken by God on the cross and uh, entered into the obscure depths of death. And here at the commencement of that, we see the final drama of his voluntary and complete self-surrender. And it's important to keep that in mind. He came to do what he's doing because there's nobody, no thing anywhere in any dimension of existence that can can compel him. Uh, he is sovereign Lord, but he's going to 
die for this creature. See, mankind must have some great potential. I, I always think about that because I look at how jacked up the world is and the mess that humanity's made of it. And I look at the embarrassing kinds of things we see from elite people that have uh, good educations and have had every opportunity. And you think, how long, Lord, can you put up with that? And why would you, to be frank? And so there's, there's inherent value in humanity, uh, uh, don't you think? Or do you think God would have died for man? That he would have died to pay the debt that he didn't know to pay our debt. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a tremendous concept to try to get your mind around. And so the time has arrived for him to surrender himself as a, as a complete sacrifice into the hands of his enemies, condemned and crucified. And for this reason, he doesn't try to frustrate the plans of Judas. He could have. Uh, you know, he, he had done that before. We don't know when Judas went and, and did the deed, but at some point he left uh, the upper room and he went and set this thing up of how he was going to turn Jesus over. But Jesus had evaded his enemies in times past by supernatural means and then sometimes just by um, good judgment. He was capable of doing that. And then uh, they wouldn't have been able to find him, much less lay hands on him. But the hour had come. And this time he doesn't resist at all. And, and when the public ministry was concluded, he has given that sign that the old dispensation is passing away because he's instituting the communion and that's going to supplant the Old Testament Passover. And now everything has been completed and he knows that the hour is struck and he goes to the place purposely where he knows that Judas will lead the mob. And the Savior, verse 40, all the time continues in his complete and total devotion towards those disciples. And uh, as I've indicated, though he has this impending suffering and the weight of all that coming down upon him that's looming dreadfully in his mental vision, he takes their interests so much to heart uh, in, in selfless love that he makes time to urge upon them Maintain communion in prayer to God, lest you should be overwhelmed by the deluge of temptations that are coming. He knows exactly what's coming. Luke gives only a brief summary of the events in verse 41 at Gethsemane. And in so doing, he makes no mention of the fact that Jesus uh, made his three most intimate followers stay near him, Matthew uh, 26, 37, nor does he mention the fact that the Lord came to these three disciples a number of times and then went back. Uh, they were overwhelmed with fatigue and, and um, you know, sometimes when people are in distress and what have you, they'll, they'll respond exactly like his disciples did. they just gone. Uh, Luke gives a summary of that. In verse 42, in every normal person, there exists the will to continue to live. Every normal, you know, whenever somebody takes their life, something's gone badly wrong because it is, it is a thing that people will do. Uh, they'll fight to live here. And I believe God, uh, in fact, I'm convinced that God programmed that into our, just into our DNA. I remember when my sweet mother was uh, passing from this life, at times she would sink into a kind of a semi coma. And then her body would resist. And she'd come back. she said, what's taking me so long to get out of here, son? And I said, I don't know, Mother. You know, I, I don't know. But he'll come for you when it's time. And did. Uh, but, but that's a, a, a normal kind of a, a reaction from somebody to have. And, and so Jesus is completely man. And... As, as the son of man, he's not subject to any blunting of his emotions. Uh, he feels just like we feel and experiences what we've experienced. And 
There's no form of inward hardening that he has that, that we don't have. Uh, he, in fact, is probably infinitely more sensitive in his feeling of repugnance towards ungodly things. Don't you know that he set the world up one way and set it in order as it should be, and then to see what humanity, you know, got so bad that he himself had to come down here and make a sacrifice so that humanity would not uh, suffer God's wrath, righteous wrath. And uh, so those, those things that he encountered day by day were no doubt offensive to him. It's impossible for him in his perfect humanity then not to experience the, the feeling of opposition to the idea of this humiliation and suffering and death that he hasn't earned. Uh, and all of this is made more intense through his knowledge that he's not only going to suffer and die, but he's going to have to undergo uh, this for the sin of mankind, not his own. You know, if you die because you earned it, that's one thing. But when you didn't, that's another, isn't it? You remember when Paul was brought up on trial, he said, if I've done anything worthy of death, then I, you know, I, I consent. You take me out and execute me, but I defy you to show me where I am. And then uh, he made an appeal. And so the holy and just wrath of God against sin is going to fall on him in full measure because he has unreservedly put himself in the place of guilty mankind. That's his determination. And the judgment pronounced on sin is what? Death. And uh, sp spiritual as well as physical. And spiritual death means to be utterly and totally and completely cut off and forsaken by God. Now how dreadful then must this idea have been to the Christ who had from eternity lived in the most intimate close association with his father, that, you know, such that we can't imagine it. And, and how thinking about being separated from him must have been. And yet he's still willing to be a, attached to that tree, sentenced like a common criminal, laden with sin of all mankind, Willing to be the sacrificial lamb of God. So I like the power and the words to convey what that. And I think you can spend a lifetime trying to plumb the depths of that, and you'll still be working on it. I just think we'll know when we get into his presence. But that's what he's done for us, what he's doing for us. And no man's ever going to be capable of, of sounding the depths, if you will, of what the Savior experienced in Gethsemane with the full reality of his suffering and soul and body uh, that penetrates into his priceless, uh, pure spirit. And when we hear his words on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Uh, the veil, if you will, is lifted for just a brief moment but that we may see something of what he endured for the sake of a guilty world. Um, however much the Savior's entire being recoiled from all that awaits him, and however violently the power of evil in these moments made a last attempt with all possible subtlety to frighten him away from the way of crucifixion, Notwithstanding all of that, he does not entertain even the least degree of sin or refusal to follow that road to the better end. He doesn't, even, he doesn't go down that, that path. It is natural and right under intense pressure and circumstances that he should say, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. But immediately... He continues, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And so he surrenders himself again voluntarily, unconditionally, to drain the cup of suffering and death to the very last drop 
in accordance with the will of God is revealed in the Old Testament prophecies and in the heart of the Savior himself ever since the commencement of his public ministry. He's known where he's going. And he's known that this outcome was there. And he's carried that burden all the way through. Why? For us. For us. Verse 43, he had finally chosen. I mean, he's chosen. I'm, the, the, the battle was won in Gethsemane. That's the reason we have a hope of what took, because of what took place there. I mean, that's where he made the decision. And we're going to see after that period of struggle from then on, he's in charge. And he is uh, princely, kingly in his responses and the way that, that he faces this. But he's chosen to be the sacrificial lamb. Some of us went and saw Mel Gibson's movie, The Crucifixion of Christ, several years ago. And I like the way they portrayed it because the, the, uh, the Satan was portrayed as a character that had a big old hooded robe on and you, know, you just see these sinister malevolent eyes slipping around, you know, the way a coward do always does. And uh, Jesus, uh, of course, you know, we've just related that, that he, that he won that battle. And so the dreadfulness of all that anguish that he endures in the garden when he has to make his final choice demanded so much of his strength, soul, body, and mind that God the Father dispatched an angel to enable him to complete the suffering and not die before his task was accomplished. You, think, you just think about that. What, what was going on there? Well, he, he was probably in danger of just physically succumbing under that pressure. Uh, it was killing him. And so he received some strengthening from the angel. Verse 44, in spite of his complete and willing surrender to bear the sin of the world in this sacrificial death, he feels the full dread so intensely and he prays so intensely that his body is taxed to the utmost. And as sweat rolls off of him, it's like drops of blood running down from him to the ground. I've read, I don't, I've never seen it, but I've read in different places that you can become so distraught that uh, capillaries will rupture in your skin and that the, the blood will mix with that sweat and it'll take a, a red hue. I don't, I don't know if that's right or that's just a story. But I do know that he, he had that reaction in the garden because the text says that, that. Absolutely landed on the line. Uh, as a man, that's, that's another thing that's hard to grasp. He made himself vulnerable and came as a man. Because Satan would have said, well, yeah, of course you can do that. You created everything, you know. Of course you can do that. You remember what Satan did whenever he asked to, to uh, try Job, you know. He said, well, you know, yeah, but you kept a fence around him. You only let me do so much. And it finally works up to the point where God said, you can do everything but kill him. Don't you kill him. Uh, and that contest takes place and Job comes out victorious. Uh, but Jesus is going to die. And he's going to defeat the last enemy, which is death. And so here he is in, engaged in a spiritual battle. And in verse 45, at long last, the wrestling in prayer is over. And he returns to his disciples. But now he's got that inward composure and that strength of mind. And he's willing to enter the road of suffering and follow it all the way to its bitter end. And the experience of the previous days, and especially that of the final night, coupled with the words of warning by Jesus to his disciples uh, and his whole demeanor that evening had overwhelmed them. Uh, it had overwhelmed them and left them without strength and sorrowful. And for that reason, and also because it had been a long day and night, the night's far advanced, they fell asleep, uh, waiting. 
military guys will tell you, you know, you learn real fast. If you get a chance to sit down, you better get some sleep. You know, they're going to set up security and all that if uh, army's moving and what have you. Uh, whenever they sit down, they're going to sleep. And they'll grab whatever rest they can because they may not get to rest anymore for a while. And so it's something similar to that kind of situation, I think. But they've fallen asleep in the Savior. Verse 46, knowing in what circumstances of extreme distress they're soon to find themselves, he wakes them up and he urges them, watch and pray. Because only as you remain very close to, to God uh, will you be able to resist the temptations that are going to assail you and the terrible events that are going to occur in the, in the days that are coming. And we shall never be able to understand or feel uh, the full depth of struggle and distress uh, that Jesus as our substitute experience there in Gethsemane while remaining perfect in loyalty towards the Father. But this we certainly know. It was there that that final choice to take our sins upon himself and for the sake of our redemption to suffer and die, that's where it took place. And so the question is, shall we not then choose to devote our all to his service? As the, as the very least thank offering that we can pay to his honor. You know, after nearly 50 years uh, of observing it, it's, uh, it's more than a little frustrating to me personally, you know, to have people act like it's a real big deal to come back on Sunday night or come back. Wednesday, there are people that can't see. There are people who got extenuating circumstances. I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about able-bodied, see, hear, all of that perfect, you know, and, and make like it's just a big deal to come sit in an air-conditioned facility. You know, uh, when I look at this situation in the garden, and, and I think about what Peter, James, John, and Paul, and all of those boys dealt with, if secular history is correct, all of them except John died uh, violently in the Lord's service. But boy, they changed the world, didn't they? Preaching that story. They changed the world um, for the better. We now come to the arrest. And while he was still speaking, behold, a crowd came, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was preceding them. And he approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those who were around him saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? That's his disciples talking. And, when, and, and one of them struck the slave of the high priest named Malchus. That's not there, but that's what his name was. And cut it off, cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, Stop, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priest and officers of the temple and elders who had come against him, Have you come out with swords and clubs as you would against a robber? While I was with you daily in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this hour and the power of darkness are yours. And so again, Complete control. Now, they don't see it that way. The world won't see it that way. He was in complete control of that situation. And in the silence and the seclusion of Gethsemane, where Jesus is alone with his Father, and when he knelt down in anguish of spirit, now after his final and complete surrender of himself to be sacrificed and bring to fulfillment the ancient prophecies and to put in action the eternal plan of salvation, he acts with great calm and fearlessness. Before his father, he had knelt deeply in complete self-surrender. But just as in his former ministry, and so now in the last stages of the way of humiliation and suffering and death, he shows not the least weakness, 
not the slightest fear of his persecutors and those who would dare to judge him. I'll tell you what, it just, it's, you, you're fearful for them, and yet they're, they brought it on themselves. Just think of those that sat in judgment of the Christ when he comes back. I mean, and those who would dare to put their filthy hands on the Son of the very God. Uh, he and his perfect humanity is master of the situation in the presence of his enemies. And even when outwardly it seems as though he's powerless prey, he, he comes out forcibly in the story of his arrest. Verses 47 and 48, the crisis concerning which Jesus had warned the disciples is upon them. It's at hand. And while he's still talking with them, a multitude with Judas appears. And they, through fear of possible resistance and on the part of the disciples, they've got a comparatively large group with them. And I'll have to say for old Peter that I don't, I don't think he cared if they brought the whole Roman army at that point. But they brought a big bunch with them, and even some members of the Sanhedrin uh, come to arrest him. That's their supreme court. And uh, the traitor, Judas, had arranged with Jesus' per uh, persecutors that the one that he saluted with the kiss would be the Nazarene whom they sought. And this was especially uh, needful at night, so there wouldn't be any risk of Jesus getting away or getting the wrong person. Um, and, you know, you think about the kiss. It's kind of like in Europe. Uh, if you've, when I was in Chile, they're very formal. And the uh, way the brethren there, they'll greet you, shake hands, and they don't actually kiss, but they'll on each, each cheek, you know. And then they back up and turn loose of hands. That's just it's a greeting that, and that'll usually be the first time they meet you. And then after that, it's less formal. Um, so something uh, along those lines. Is what's taking place. And Jesus, uh, uh, when, the, when it came to the Savior and his disciples, the traitor immediately steps forward. He's wanting that money, isn't he? To salute the Lord with a kiss and thus to indicate him as the one that they've come for. And from Mark uh, chapter 14, 45, we know that the Savior permitted him to do that. And only afterwards, said Judas, would you betray me with a kiss? And in these last words of the Lord to the one who had so often had an opportunity of learning, so often had an opportunity of being with him, of knowing and loving him, but who loved the darkness more than the light, for the last time Jesus is trying to bring the man to his senses. He's making a play for that guy's soul. May, you know, perhaps maybe he'll still come to repentance. That's the Lord that we serve. You know, that's the way he is. Um, I don't know about you, but I like that. I think I'm fairly patient, but the Lord's willingness uh, to forgive is just near, near boundless. What does that say to us? If we seek forgiveness, he tells us what? We must be forgiving, right? And, um, and so you, you, none of us can say, well, I, you know, I, just, I just can't do that. Um, if we couldn't do it, he wouldn't have said do it, would he? And so uh, there we are. Right? And, and he, he shows the example. Verse 49 and 50, even before the Savior could reply, to the question of the disciples, do we draw swords? Brother Peter's already made the decision in his case. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about that next time, our Lord willing. Yes, sir. We know the religious leaders have seen and heard the power of Jesus and hearing. In any respect, you know, that's the power of hate. That's the power of hate, and it's the power of, uh, of selfishness. So, because they're, the, they're in the top spot in society, and he's a threat. 
to them. And so they're willing, they're willing to do anything. You know, it's incredible. We don't want to go there ourselves. God bless you.